Well, good morning. It's great to have everybody here. It feels great to be back in this, uh, this spot to be able to have our uh, press conferences and be a, most of you in person, which is great. So I uh, appreciate you being here. Just want to start by saying that uh, I had a great, uh, great finish to, to fall camp with our mock game on Saturday. It's something we traditionally do to be able to create game-like situations and great game-like flow for our players and, and uh, simulating you know, where we're going to be at on the field for everything that we do from start to finish and, and then uh, have a great practice of situational football in spiders. So that was really effective, I thought, and very good. And now ready to get into uh, a game week mode for our team. So just really appreciate our players' focus and effort throughout fall camp and thought that that's been very positive. Now we've got to get ready uh, for uh, opportunity number one. I uh, do want to announce our captains. We voted for those guys um, this weekend, and uh, we actually have six, and I think it's pretty indicative of this team. Uh, we just have a large number of guys. Uh, I think since I've been here, it's the most we've had in terms of getting double-digit votes by their teammates. Uh, just a large group of guys, uh, and even many that didn't get selected, uh, were very, you know, were close, and you know, which kind of speaks to the depth of our leadership on this team, and a lot of guys that are respected, and and guys that um, you know were were, uh, were voted on by their teammates. Uh, Michael McFadden, Michael Penix, Cam Jones, Ty Freifogel, Marcelino Ball, and Peyton Hendershot. Uh, we have three on offense, three on defense, and uh, just really feel like. Uh, it's a great group of young men that have been here for a while and have bought in and uh, have, uh, um, as I went through and challenged our team when they were about to vote, you know, and just gave three things we were looking for and, and just talking about guys that, uh, that you trust, guys that uh, live out LEO, uh, not perfect, nobody is, but uh, guys that, uh, you know, hold themselves accountable and hold their teammates accountable. So, obviously... Uh, uh, strong group of guys there that uh, this team has voted as the captains for 2021. And then uh, really want to uh, say how excited we are to open our season at Iowa. And uh, so much respect for Coach Ferentz and what he's built um, at Iowa for so many years and the consistency and, and such a great program. Great opportunity for this program to play on the road there at Kinnick Stadium. And, and it's going to be a great atmosphere. It's great to have the fans back. And it's going to be a tough and challenging environment to be in without question. And so, but uh, just so much respect for their team as you go through and you evaluate them. I know everybody's in the same boat. You're looking at uh, 2020 film and projecting some things you know, personnel wise and, and uh, schematically all and everybody's in, in that same situation. But, uh, you know, defensively, they're just so sound. Do such a great job up front and, and how, you know, just disciplined they are physicality at the linebacker position and athleticism there. And then the, the secondary is really where their most experience lies. And so many different uh, guys back there play a lot of football and, and they just don't, uh, they don't make a lot of mistakes. They make you really have to execute at a high level. And then offensively just starts up front for them and, and uh, excellent running game. And the quarterback that I know that uh, uh, played uh, some really good football, especially as the season progressed. And, I, you know, they expect and we expect him to, you know, take that growth opportunity like we all did not have a previous spring like he did not. And, and uh, you know, just a guy that uh, highly talented individual that has a big time arm and, and a lot of weapons around him. They're always good at tight end and that continues to be the case. And same at receiver, a lot of playmakers there. And, and uh, special teams really jumps out. They were the number one special teams unit in the Big Ten last year overall. And uh, we were actually number two overall. So uh, that's going to be play a big role in this game. And they're very talented in the return game and at a specialist position. And, and so a lot of respect for this program. And so we're going to have to uh, play our best football. So excited for the opportunity. Questions? Tom, we've talked a lot in the last couple of years about your own growth and maturity as a head coach. But uh, last year with this program being in the national spotlight a lot and taking that next step as you would have preferred uh, this program, that target path to be on, what have you learned from that that helps you get ready for this 2021 season and what might lie ahead this year as well? Yeah, I think that uh, the thing that you learned is, is just the, the true value of, of staying uh, true to the process, you know, and, and how you get your team to perform 
you know, because it's all about consistent performance and, and how do you get that, you know, and whether that's through, you know, high expectations, low expectations or everything in between, how do you get your team to perform uh, at a high level each and every week to be able to block out those distractions. And in the past, those distractions have been negative distractions of people telling you what you can't do and judging you based on your past. And, and then now you have to be able to block out the, the positive distractions and people, maybe some people saying that you, you know, they're expecting you to do more things than, than you've maybe done in the past. And, and you still have those that, that, that to continue to doubt, but that's part of it. That's okay. But I think just understanding how to to uh, address that with your guys. I think you don't uh, shy away from it. I don't think, uh, think anything that's assumed and not addressed in both positive and negative situations, I don't think creates a neg- very positive outcome. I think you need to address things. And so we've tried to address this and talk about it as a team and, and being able to um, allow ourselves to consistently prepare at a high level. You know, because, you know, that's why Chase was chosen in 2021, the beginning there in January, because I wanted us to be able to elevate our program. And you don't just get better because you have a lot of guys back and you got to, you know, you know, a lot of guys that uh, are supposed to be playing at a certain level. Uh, it's what are you doing every single day? So I think it's just been a, a just a, a confirmation of how you how you do that. And, and, I, and I've been fortunate to be a lot of places that have, you know, had been a part of turnarounds and then you have success and then you have to play to those standards. And so uh, not as necessary as a, as a college head coach, but definitely part of those staffs and then, and then and that, and in high school as well. So just um, I think it's, it's just people. It's, it's leading a team. It's building a team. And those principles are consistent and the same no matter what the level is. But, but I think it's the discipline to be true to who you are every day. And, and not fall victim to uh, listening to the outside noises that, that occasion. I think that to me is really the key to all this. And, and, and what, what time teaches you is to, to trust that, to not try to go out and reach for things that, that uh, you think might be what they are. I think it's uh, sometimes we overcomplicate situations and it's, uh, it's not easy, but it's a simple process. Um, you've talked about this a little bit, even going as far back as maybe the spring, certainly media days, but with Ty, what were the conversations like with him when he was going through the process in terms of weighing up his decision, Ty Freifogel, to, to stay or go? And I guess just kind of, to what degree did he vocalize, I suppose, recognizing what he could get out of coming back for another year in terms of saying, this is where I know I can get better mm-hmm. if I come back, and this is where I want to aim, and, and this is kind of what I have in mind? Yeah, I think for Ty, you know, in his decision making process, you know, and we treated him like we did all the guys, you know, we go through and we, you know, have a chance to sit down with them. Uh, it was a little bit unique, I think, with Ty, with, with Ty, because he, if I just kind of would give you a, a transparent answer, it was like in the beginning, I felt pretty confident that he would probably come back. Then in the middle, I was like 50-50. I wasn't sure. And then at the end, I was like, you know what? I, was, I felt pretty, after meeting with him again, I felt pretty good uh, that, he, that he had had that decision made up that he was going to return. And, and I think it's a, it's a healthy process to go through. And I think for him, you know, he was from the very beginning pretty um, realistic about where he stood. You know, he understood the, the you kind of look at the, you know, two, two areas, you know, you look at the pool of guys that are going to be entering the draft and how that affects you and where you kind of fall within that group. And then you look at yourself and how much more do I have uh, to grow and to, to improve. And so he looked at those two things and, and, and really felt from the beginning that it would probably be in his best interest to return. But the thing about Ty that I really, really love, and I mentioned it, you know, I think last week, but, you know, and I, I've come to the conclusion where if, if a young man kind of gets in his head that, you know, it's time to move on, um, it's hard to kind of reprogram that back, you know. And I've seen guys come back and, and they're worried about getting hurt and they're worried about this and they're trying to – they start pressing because they want to make more plays because this is, you know, like, hey, came back for this. And, and they don't just let the game just, you know, come to them. And they have a little bit different – um, approach to practice, you know, and, and I just, man, I never sensed that from him. And it was just, it was full speed ahead every practice. Um, never, ever looking for, you know, any veteran days off during spring ball or fall camp. I mean, just doesn't have any, that wasn't even part of his processing. You know, you do a great job as a staff of taking care of him, you know, and, and he's obviously earned the right to, to be able to have maybe some of those things, but he wasn't ever asking for them, never expected them. And I think that's a big deal. And, and he practices so hard. 
and he and he just he's physical and he's tough and I've just been impressed I mean like I said I've done this enough to see guys all different ways and and sometimes like I said when a guy comes back and doesn't have that right mindset it's almost like he just should he, he probably would have been better off if he would have moved moved ahead because they're just not he was good a football player because you know they got there by playing with an edge and playing just relentless in how they approach things and that's how you got to play at this level so and that's how you have to prepare at this level so I just think he has a he's a mature young man and like I said, he didn't, uh, we laid the facts out. And like I said, Coach Hurd did a great job talking with him as well. And, but I think he knew from the beginning that it would probably be in his best interest to, to keep developing and, and have an opportunity. And obviously he has a close relationship with Michael Penix and, and you know, with Michael coming back. And so I think those things play variables as well, you know, for him and his, and his decision-making. But uh, really glad he was here with us another year and he got voted as captain, you know, which last year he wasn't, wasn't a captain. And so it's a tremendous honor for him to be viewed that way by his teammates. And, and he's, he's a very quiet leader without question, but within the receiver room and by his daily actions, he, he's, his, his actions speak very, very loudly. So I know these uh, depth charts we got on Mondays aren't exactly set in stone or anything, but Stephen Carr's at the top of it at running back. Are you, I guess, at this point ready to name him your opening day starting running back? If, if so, how did he win that? If not, where's competition? So are there any other positions that you feel like you've made a decision at? Yeah, I, I think for him at that position, you know, it became pretty obvious, you know, um, there's no doubt, you know, he came here new and he had to earn that. And uh, I believe that uh, he has. And so, um, but, you know, we're going to play a lot of guys in that position, always, always have, always will. Uh, but he will be uh, the, the starter for game one. And I feel like that, uh, um, once again, it was really, you know, from day one, you know, he came here um, with zero entitlement at all. Uh, know he had to earn the spot, ready to work, total team guy. Uh, not just in his words, his words definitely were that way, but his actions. And that's what I look for, you know, and just body language and, and just how hard does he practice and how hard does he work on special teams and during those drills and those things that we ask him to do in those areas, you know. So, uh, but, a, but a, a, room, a room that we really are excited about and he's, uh, you know, elevated himself within that room and, and uh, love how, how he practices, you know, just even watching him, you know, during our last couple of days, we've been going with some spider practices and just going full speed and finishing runs out. And, and so, you know, that's what you want and all the guys, and, and that's the standard that Coach McCullough has set in that room. So, but uh, yeah, excited for him and feel like that he is uh, a guy that I think that, you know, even in that room and on the offensive side of the football, everybody would agree that he's earned it. We've uh, seen Mike, uh, all, you know, during camp, obviously. He's still full go, and uh, how has he looked the last week? And then also, uh, how are David Ellis and CO doing? Are they uh, ready to go also? Yeah, so I would say that, uh, um, you know, really encouraged with Michael's progress. And, you know, I know we've talked about him for the last several months, and, and uh, probably uh, every time I've spoken, you know, I've gotten a question about him. And, uh, and understandably so. But I think that, uh, you know, all along it's always been about just constant progress, you know, constant working for him. And, and matter of fact, met with him last this past weekend and met with several different guys and for different reasons. And, and he and I talked about that and I really compliment him on his just, you know, buying into that process and how hard it is. You're going through fall camp, fall camp's hard. And, you know, he's doing more than he's ever done in regards to every time we had a, a, a special teams period or a different type of period, he was always with the, the, the training staff doing extra work doing with our, with our you know, both weight room staff as well as our medical guys just doing rehab and strengthening and conditioning and just doing extra things and did that all fall camp. And even, even the last week, you know, so he bought into that. He understood that was part of it. It was a, it was a constant process to get him ready for September 4th. And so very encouraged by his uh, progress. And he's right where we hoped he would be. And he's, uh, you know, 100% ready to be the starter on Saturday. And uh, so that's great. And then uh, um, David Ellis is still progressing. So I, I would say uh, uh, just continuing to, to monitor that. And every day we got several days now to get him in that position. So um, Hopeful, but you never know. And then uh, CO uh, has has been cleared, and so he's ready to go. And uh, he'll be uh, he'll be with us uh, tomorrow out there at practice. So uh, just you know, there's going to be guys that are working through some things, and which is always the case. You know, this even this time of year, even though you haven't played a game yet, and we got a few guys in that mode. So we'll uh, the guys are ready. They're going to play. If not, next man up. Tom, have you used much of the extra time to look at Iowa, and what are your 
takeaways of that team right now? Yeah, a lot of time to watch them. Uh, like you said, all three phases, impressive. You know, just uh, they, uh, you, you have to physically, you know, beat them. You know, they don't beat themselves very often, you know, and that's a, a, a key thing. If you think about, you know, just the fundamentals of this game, you know, when you you think about how they have long-term success in a program and there's a toughness to their program that, that, you, that sticks out. And that's, that's a key to long-term success. And, you know, special teams play sticks out and that's a key to long-term success and consistent performance. And they do a great job in that area. Very well coached. Uh, don't make a lot of mistakes. Um, you run the football well, you stop the run. You know, that makes it tough on, on teams. You know, they don't give up a lot of explosive plays schematically and, and by their discipline on defense. And so that's another – so a lot of things all kind of add to the reason why they, they, uh, they're they good every year, you know. And so that's uh, something that you look at in their player development. They get guys that kind of have prototypical guys at each spot, you know, per their height and weight, you know, different numbers maybe every year, but similar results. And so that's just a sign of a – of a consistency there and a, a program that's been in place for a long time, a staff that's been in place for a long time. So that's why I just, a lot of respect from my perspective, from my, you know, as, as the head coach at Indiana and, and what we're attempting to build here every single year and have a consistency that no matter, you know, who's out there each given year, they play at a certain standard and that's what you see from them. So there's a reason why they're, you know, some are picking them to win the West and that's kind of seemed that way every year. They're always in that conversation. So hats off to them. And so we got to be able to, you know, going to play really good. So just a two part question, if you don't mind my asking. So first you talked a little bit about, you know, attention on, on, on the program earlier. Do you enjoy that? How have you, I mean, is this different than anything you've handled in the past and then have, have, former players reached out to you at all kind of ahead of the season just um, with any messages at all coming into it? Yeah, I would say there's been a lot of uh, messages, um, a lot of excitement within our alumni base uh, about our program and, and where we are and, and the direction that we're going. So yeah, that's been super awesome to have that. Appreciate their, their engagement and, and their excitement. Guys that, uh, you know, Vaughn Dunbar is a young man that uh, came by, you know, last weekend and uh, I knew who he was. Uh, he's a year older than, than me. Um, knew him out of high school and comes here, and but never met him before. And so just a great, great player here without question. But just to hear him talk about, you know, the program and how excited he is and got a chance to see the facilities. He hadn't been back in a while. And, and uh, just talked about, man, would love to be able to, to, to be here at this time and, and be a part of what's going on. And then just the, even the, the locker room, the way it looks, is so different than when he played and, and even the way the stadium looks and feels. And so just, to, you know, just hats off to our administration for what they've invested in football. So guys like that, you know, but yeah, it's a, there's definitely a lot of that and that's awesome. And, but yeah, the expectations are what they are. Like we've said in the beginning, we, you know, came here with a, a vision to, to be able to change the expectations and create belief. And uh, that process is ongoing. And so, yeah, we're embracing it. And, uh, but you got to, like you said, you got to be able to have those, you know, earmuffs and blinders. That part doesn't change. And to be able to create the focus that you want to be able to be an elite performer on game day. Uh, coach, in a sport <clears throat> where interceptions have become less and less, uh, fewer of them, I guess you'd say, whether it's because of the pace of the play or, you know, shorter passes, you were, your team was very, um, uh, very good at that last year. Why do you think that was, and how do you try and teach those, those kids the ball skills? Well, I, I think you get what you emphasize, you know, and we emphasize so much about um, takeaways, you know, and uh, we have three, um, we call it our DNA on defense, and we have, a, we have a DNA for offense, defense, and special teams, so the DNA on defense is takeaways, tackling, and effort, and takeaways is the very first one. It's been that way since I've been here, and I believe in that. And, and so we, we, man, we just work on it. And, you know, if you, if you come to our practice, they're going to be doing something with takeaways every single day. We say we install that mindset every single day. And so, and there's multiple layers to it. You know, there's the pressure up front that you have to use to create those opportunities. And, you know, quarterbacks, you know, if they have time to throw and they get in rhythm and they can step up into their throws and, you know, do that on time, they're hard to, you know, to get. But if you can get them off their spot, you can get them to move around, you can make them feel uncomfortable mentally and physically. So it's affecting the quarterback. That's a big variable. And it's, so it's the pressure up front, which affects the quarterback. And then the mental affecting of the quarterback is how well you can disguise you know, your, your coverages and the things that you're doing in the back end. And then there's ball skills. You got to catch the ball. 
you know, and so we're working on ball skills every day. And I tell them, I said, they, they're not on defense because they can't catch. They're on defense because they're great athletes and uh, they can, uh, you know, create the takeaway. Uh, and we say they're, they are created. You know, they don't just happen by chance. And so I get it. Certain years you get more than others. And, you know, there's been years where we've worked on them and, and we don't ever work on them any less. But uh, definitely those were um, – and I'll take them any way we can get them, whether they're fumbles or, or interceptions. We just want to get the ball from, from the offense and give it to our offense. And so uh, I just think that uh, there's a lot of reasons for – us creating those and and they're big you know it's how you win football games you know you got to protect it on offense and and you got to be able to create the takeaways on defense coach Micah McFadden and Ty Freifogel they, they're your captains they're all Americans they were also probably the lowest rated recruits in their respective mm -hmm. classes how, how were they so undiscovered in recruits and what, what have been the keys for them to, to take that step yeah I mean it's probably uh you know that's a great question to, to ask as far as how were they not uh, given more recognition in high school. You know, I guess there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, you, know, you got a guy like Micah who did play in a, um, you know, a high profile high school program. Uh, the benefit that I had was, you know, my son played with him. So I, I got to watch him practice. You know, when I was at South Florida, uh, the way uh, everything worked in regards to my schedule, uh, I had the Tampa Bay area as my recruiting area. And so that was one unique thing. I, didn't, I, I never left the state to recruit. I really hardly never left, you know, for recruiting for my, my area. I didn't really recruit. I didn't leave the Tampa Bay area. So, and they practiced actually at night. And so what I would do is I would go and I would do my, and because I was a dad, I, could just, I was allowed to be there as much as I wanted to be. And so um, literally they would, you know, I would go do my recruiting during the springtime. Uh, as the DC there and then I would go at night and stand up sit up on the press box with their video guy and watch practice you know and so um, just got to see him play a lot and I thought he was a really good player and I was actually shocked that he didn't get more highly recruited and uh, but I will say this you know he was a guy that uh, you know probably so my first year that Thomas was there he he uh, um, wasn't you know, getting to play that much, you know, and, and uh, which is maybe a little unusual for a guy that goes on to be what he's become for sure. And so, but then his, Thomas' senior year, which would have been Micah's junior year, it started to, started to click for him. And what I noticed, he won with special teams. I mean, that's where he first, that's where I noticed just the nose for the ball, you know, covering kicks, covering punts. And, and I think it's, and I learned that from, from Coach Dolahan years ago. There's two sides to that. So he used to always tell me that if you want to find out who your good running backs are, and we did this with our sophomores when they came to the varsity for the first time at Ben Davis. We just kick them the ball and just see, see how they handle making people miss, you know, and same way on covering kicks. You find out who your linebackers and your safeties are by who can cover kicks. And so I would say that was kind of, I've never forgot that, you know, and so I'd watch him on special teams and I would, you could just see who's got an act to get to the guy with the ball. And so that's why I say it's a simple game. So if you got the ball in your hands, you got to make guys miss and go score. On defense, you got to find the guys that got the football and get them on the ground, you know. And I thought Mike had a knack for that, you know. So, uh, and then he just kept playing. He just played better and better. And so, but still, he never got a lot of, he's probably maybe a little undersized, you know. And so, but, um, you know, I didn't care. I knew he was good. And, and uh, we uh, went ahead and pulled the trigger on him and, and never wavered with it. And then with Ty, you know, it was, he's from a really small high school. And, and you know, South Mississippi, not a lot of people go down there to watch him. And Coach Hurd had a chance to, you know, watch him have him in camp when he was at Ole Miss. And, and uh, so he believed in him, you know, even though he, once again, was not a highly recruited uh, ranked guy. And so, and he, he took a little longer when he got here to kind of figure some things out, but always had really good ball skills and uh, just kept getting stronger and faster. And, and uh, so I, I just think sometimes it's just a matter of having that gut, you know, where you think a kid's got something to him. And, and but you say both of them are tough guys. Both of them are actually pretty quiet and they love to work. You know, so I think you kind of get those core things you look for in guys and they fit with us character wise and and got to know their families and, and believe they were really high quality young men that they were going to come here and do everything we asked them to do. And then they just bought in and, and they took off. So I guess it's a it's a great story. It's a great testament to these young men and how hard they've been willing to work and and to our coaching staff to kind of know some key things you want to look for in a young man. And when you find that you trust your evaluation and you and you have to, you know, kind of not be, you know, fall victim to the recruiting rankings. You know, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. But, you know, recruifigruiting is not an exact science. I mean, anybody that acts like they got it figured out there, they're not being honest. You know, it's, it's hard to project sometimes. But you just got to trust your gut and press on. 
Tom, um, my understanding is that the rules this year did, allowed you to only have nine practices where you could tackle. Mm. How much of a factor do you think that is going into the first game, especially, and what might your biggest concern going into the first game be? Yeah, interestingly enough, with, when you looked at those rules, um, we went back and looked at our last two years of practice, and we did not have to modify anything to meet the standards for those requirements. Uh, we've only ever had two full scrimmages since I've been here um, in, in regards to where you had, you know, whole time of just live tackling in the scrimmage situation. And then the number of practices that we had that were um, considered tackle practices and portions of that. So the good news is um, I think we've already had, I had become a believer in that, trying to keep guys up, keep guys healthy. We try to emphasize tackling, you know, either bags or you know tackling sleds or whatever things that you different mechanisms you can use to especially last year we, we were trying to even do that because of COVID and trying to eliminate the you know individual contacts of guys when we were kind of in the beginning stages of trying to figure out COVID but but uh, but even 2019 we kind of had this similar so so I feel good about that but I think you always are going to find that week one tackling is always you know a little bit of a concern I think you always worry about that um, and we, cause you, especially when you're playing since such a good running back and then some receivers that have some escapability on their, on their team. But hopefully on our side, we got that same benefit as well against them. So uh, I think that you just got to work on as much as you can. And within the rules that you got, like I said, I feel good about what we were able to do compared to what we've done in the past. And, uh, but to me, hopefully because we have more guys that have played. You know, I remember two years ago when this group was playing in 2019, our first game of the season, we had – way too many missed tackles in that first game in, there in Lucas Oil Stadium. And so, um, but uh, I remember Michael was one of them, had a lot of, had a lot of missed tackles. And uh, so, I mean, he was younger then, two years younger for sure. But uh, hopefully the, the experience and the reps and all things we've done, but we've worked so hard to try and within those rules of, you know, because you got to be, when the second DNA that we talk about on defense after takeaways is tackling. Yeah, we want to be the best tackling team in America. And so uh, we've just got to keep working on it. And we will continue to do that because we won't live tackle the rest of the season except on game day. A uh, couple, I guess, kind of a double barrel question. First of all, did you, did you ever find out the origin of Jaron Handy's nickname, uh, Stone, and, and kind of attached onto that? With him and Ryder, we've asked you a lot about them going back to when they came into the program. But now as the kind of the rubber meets the road, you start thinking about actual game plans and where they fit in. What are those two guys going to bring your defensive line that maybe either it didn't have or maybe it didn't have enough of, I guess, last season? Yeah, I think first of all, um, you know, I really – the maturity and leadership of, of Ryder is what sticks out. You know, the, the physical maturity. He, he's a big man, you know, um, not only tall but just he's thick and strong. And uh, I, I think he's, he's provided what I hoped he would – when, when he came here, and that was uh, to a position group that uh, did not have a lot of strong um, leadership in terms of just guys that were confident to speak. A lot of good guys, but not them um, that are willing to speak up. And for him to come in here and, and with a new team, uh, it helped he came in in January. But uh, so he's provided that, and then just steady play, you know, just consistency and understanding football. And, and, um, I just hope he, you know, the, the, the hope is that he just elevates that room, you know, and I, and I think we've seen that in their preparation, but obviously it matters what they do on game day. And then as far as with, with Stone, I mean, it's just uh, an athleticism, you know, that he has naturally. Um, he, uh, uh, we uh, actually had them by position groups come to our house over the summer. And uh, so we had the whole D-line over there and we're playing basketball uh, there in our driveway and uh, um, fortunately, we purchased one of those, uh, I think it's a gorilla um, basketball. So it's very sturdy, I guess that's my point, with like a breakaway ring. Because if we had not, he would have completely destroyed our basketball hoop, the way he dunked the ball so violently and athletically multiple times. And so uh, our, our goal survived. But uh, I left there just kind of like, whoa. That's different, you know, and so, uh, but he's still young and just trying to, you know, learn a system and it's new for him and, and everything. So, but I think that's, uh, you know, rushing the passer 
with both those guys is what you want them to bring, stopping the run, uh, being physical guys, and, and they, get, they got length. Both of them are tall and, and long, and, and uh, you know, Stone definitely, uh, the really athleticism is what sticks out uh, when, you, when you see him play. So that's something that we need, you know, in this program. We just talk about being able to affect the quarterback. You know, that's, that's the number one job that you want to do defensively and, 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 and be able to physically do that. So that's, that's really where uh, those guys, I need them to just keep buying in and playing hard and practicing hard and getting better every single week. All right, Greg, last one. Hey, Tom, I'm um, kind of a two-parter. It's both about, about Penix. Um, you mentioned this, the extra work for him he's been doing. Does that continue leading up to Saturday, or does he have a normal workload now? And then part two is... I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I don't know how this works with naming him, announcing him the starter. I know it's kind of been assumed all along he'd be ready, but until he's ready, he's not ready. So did, was there ever a moment in practice or in the locker room where you, you know, announced the team Michael starting or just kind of let it go? Yeah, I, I would say more let it go. Um, we definitely didn't announce it. Um, I, I guess that uh, to answer your question, though, which is it's a good question about his – the process that you go through. Um, yeah, I mean, there was the expectation that he would be ready, but he had to get ready, you know, so, uh, and he's done that. And so, yeah, he, he will be the starter um, on Saturday. And uh, so uh, that, was, that was the expectation from the beginning, you know, if he did what he was supposed to do. And now there's no doubt it could have, you know, it could have not been the case, you know, based on if things didn't go the way you want them to or, or whatever happens along the process. So there's no guarantees with that. But, but as far as naming it for the team, we never really um, had, to, had to say that, you know. And so, but at the same time, you know, we've had opportunities for Jack to take reps with the ones, which he's done that consistently throughout camp and, and uh, to make sure both guys are ready. And then obviously getting, you know, Donovan McCauley ready as well, just because you got three guys there that that, uh, that uh, I believe all have special skill sets. So, you know, bottom line is that, that Michael's been doing a, a great job in the things we've asked. And then to, you, to your question about throughout the, the season, it's more of a maintenance part of that, you know. So in, in, in fall camp, there's a lot of conditioning emphasis and, and doing specific things to continue to rehab. So the, the rehab part of it, I think the maintenance part, just like in, in any other guy that's injured, you know, you go through that. But uh, from a conditioning perspective, no, won't be doing those extra things. But uh, you just continue to maintain uh, the exercise that you do. You know, we do things, you know, a lot of guys have that that they do. You know, oftentimes that happens pre pre-practice and post-practice, which will be the same case with him and more of that probably than during practice. So, but uh, that will be a continuous part of his process. Like even other guys are coming back from, from either ACL surgeries or either, you know, with Thomas and his hip surgery, he has things he has to keep doing and will continue to do throughout the season. All right, thanks, Tom. Awesome. Have a great day. Elio.